Well, within the first couple of days, we realized that Jared's lungs were not functioning well and uh, they did not realize the extent of the problem at first. I was released from the hospital about three and a half days after my cesarean, and the next morning we got a call. I'd just gotten home from the hospital, got, had one night's sleep, and the doctor called us about five in the morning and said, Jared is not doing well. He's crashing, we need to send him to Denver to be on an oscillator ventilator, which would be gentler on his lungs. And um, they, I could just tell they weren't sure he was, he was even gonna make it over there. And so here we were, we were already 70 miles from the hospital. We just threw stuff in our car. We raced to the hospital to be there. Joel flew with him. I was not in any shape having just had surgery to go. And so I remember just standing over his incubator. He looked horrible and, and telling him goodbye. I couldn't even touch him. They wouldn't even let me touch him. He'd you be, didn't think you'd see him again? I didn't think did I'd you? see him again. I thought that was it. I told him goodbye and I watched Joel and Jerry get on a plane and fly 250 miles over the mountains. Other side of... Colorado. Other side of Colorado. One of, the, one of the sweet moments in this separation, I don't know if it was your idea or someone else encouraged you to send a hanky mm -hmm. and a tape. I think the tape was your idea. Yeah. Tell us about that. One of the nurses actually came up with that. She said, put a hanky next to your skin for a while and, um, and, and just let it rest there and, and get your smell on it. And then I made a tape um, for Jarrett singing to him. I read Bible stories and I sang <coughs> songs and sent that all to Denver to be with him. And they put that hanky in his incubator next to him so he could smell my scent. And Isn't apparently the effect was it dramatic. It was. When they would, and they put a little tiny tape player in his incubator. And when they would play, you know, me talking to him and just saying, Jarrett, I love you, Jesus loves you, singing to him, reading books to him, he would, his heart rate would just calm. It was, it was incredible. Mm -hmm. And so I couldn't be there. I literally couldn't be there for the first couple of weeks, which was just horrible. I was on the other side of the mountains with Brennan and Mackenzie, and at least though my presence could be there with him. Interesting, so interesting, that bond. Yeah. Mother, child. Our first picture is when you see him again, two right. weeks. Later. Yeah, two weeks later, this is one of the first times that I got to hold him. And Look at that tiny, tiny. He was absolutely tiny. The doctors encouraged skin to skin. The baby's just, you know, resting right on our skin. And, and so we held him like that a lot. The next picture, it's three weeks in. This is quite a moment. It is. This is the first time that I held my boys together. And <laughs> it was a pretty emotional moment for me. I remember thinking they're so tiny, but they're still such an armful. And um, so this was really neat. Three weeks in, getting to hold them both together. It's the first time they were together outside of the womb. It's, um, you know, as I've said, it's, it's impossible to do the play-by-play -play in yeah. our segment here. Uh, you're going to have to read the book, Grace, thus far. Uh, so many close calls. Mm. Some, some medical slips. You yeah. really have to be the parent advocate. Mm -hmm. You're the one that knows the baby, knows what's routine. Some very scary moments in all of this. Um, and, and calamities, like the, the, the first time you and Joel were together and able to be not carers, not with right. the babies, uh, you were in Denver. <laughs> Tell us what happened. <laughs> we, we had just left the hospital just for an hour to go get lunch. We hadn't seen each other for a couple of weeks. Obviously, we're cr incredibly stressed out and um, just driving down a busy avenue and got in a, a car wreck and a pretty decent car wreck. And of course, totaled I was the car, didn't totaled it? the car pretty much. I was just out of surgery. And so, you know, I was not, I was pretty sore. Oh, I just... Emotionally spent? Yes, and I remember crawling in. So we didn't have anybody to call to come and get us. We're on this busy street, and the tow truck driver came to get us and was going to give us a ride, and where do you want to go? And we said, just take us to the hospital. We, you know, we didn't have any, didn't know anybody in Denver. It was a pretty low moment, I have to say. Pretty, pretty discouraging. There would be lower moments. Yes. And uh, we read about depression and hopelessness, mm -hmm. finding a place. Mm -hmm. in, in your journey. 25% of couples with special needs children don't make it. Their marriages fail. And you and Joel got stretched pretty mm -hmm. thin. Um, how did your faith carry you? And, and I mean, at one point you say the only conversations you were having with God were angry ones. Yeah. Um, take I, us there for a minute. I did. I struggled. I, I really started to struggle. You know, I had... Um, 
been a pastor's wife. I came to know the Lord when I was just a little girl. I wanted to be a missionary. And I, I just remember going through all these things that I had done for God. And, um, you know, tell, I just remember saying, I didn't even rebel as a teenager, really, you know, and I've been good, kind of like I've been a good girl, God, and I don't understand why you're gonna take our son. The doctors were giving us no hope at all. And um, I, I just began to go through a time of being very angry at God and, and just telling him how unfair he was to do this to our family. And um, it was a very miserable time for me. I have discovered that there is nowhere more miserable than uh, being apart from a relationship with God because God is our comfort. He's our hope and our rock. His word is where our answers are. And I was just sort of pushing all that away. I didn't say that out loud. I would have never said that. Um, be too embarrassed at that point, but that's what I was feeling inside. And I look back at that time and realize how patient God was with me. He just kept bringing his word to me and kept bringing different scriptures that I had known since I was a child. And the one that really specifically spoke to me was Romans 8, 28. <gasps> the one you never quote to a person in crisis. Exactly. And of course, everybody was quoting it to me and it was kind of making me mad, to be honest. Mm -hmm. And because I wanted to say, how do you know that God's going to work this out for good? And yet when God finally got a hold of my heart and I really looked at that verse, it says, and we know, not and we think or we hope or we wonder, we know all things, all of it works together for good to those who love God, who are called according to his purpose. And I had to stop in my anger and say, God, I know I love you. I know your word is true. So this verse is true. And I know I'm called to your purpose. So I'm making the decision to trust you no matter what. If you're going to work it all out for good, I trust you. Even if you take our son home, I trust you whatever you want to do in my life. And what's amazing to me is it wasn't like God stepped in and changed our circumstances right away, but he changed my heart. Mm -hmm. And even in the middle of the storm, in fact, things just got worse from there for Jarrett. I still had a peace that couldn't be explained apart from Christ. You and Joel came to a place sitting in the car mm -hmm. where you faced reality. Yeah. And I think there was a release there. Yeah. We had, it was right about Christmas time and my parents had come and they got a, let me just say, we were living in a hotel room. We had Mackenzie who was not even two. We had Brennan who was just a fussy preemie because he was out of his routine. He didn't feel good. He was in and out of the hospital. This is our healthy one. He just had to grow basically. He just had to grow, but he was on oxygen and monitors that went off all night long. We weren't getting any sleep. We were at the hospital every day under all this stress. And my parents came and I, I still laugh. My mom took one look at Joel and I and said, you guys are stressed out. <laughs> it was like, that was the understatement of the year. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And she said, you need a date. Isn't that just like a mom? And so she sent Joel and I off on this date and we intended to just go get a nice dinner, relax, kind of forget about things for a few hours, enjoy each other's company. And we got in the car and we drove to some parking lot somewhere in Denver. I couldn't even tell you where we landed. And we just sat there. We couldn't even get out of the car. We were just exhausted. Mm -hmm. And I turned to Joel and I looked at him and his eyes were full of tears. And he said, honey, I'm so scared. He's not going to make it. 